Good evening and welcome to Mining the Riches of the Parsha. Tonight is Thursday night, December 16th, 2021. I am so grateful to every one of you for joining tonight. It is a tremendous pleasure to be able to spend this time studying with you. Rav Yosef Soloveitchik, known as the Rav, is someone that I quote to you very, very often. Someone who had and continues to have a profound influence on my life. His outlook, his teaching is something that I have made part of my life in many, many ways. I did not study at Yeshiva University. And most of what I know of the Rav that I share with you and my own learning has been what I heard other people say in his name, what I've read, lectures of his that I have listened to recordings or watched videos. But for about three months in 1979, I had the privilege to listen and attend his classes in person in New York. And what I'd like to share with you tonight, the first two pieces that I want to share with you tonight are from a sheer a lecture that I had the privilege to hear in person. So while I uh, value and uh, am moved by and enlightened by everything that the Rav did and said, um, these two pieces have a special place within me just in terms of an actual personal connection that I heard this from him directly in person. <clears throat> so next week's Parsha is the beginning of the second book of the Torah, the book of Shemos, which begins with the Parsha of Shemos, which starts with the following words, the Ele Shemos B'nei Yisrael, and these are the names of the Jewish people, Yaakov's family, that traveled down from Israel to Egypt. The Ramban and others asked the following question. In last week's Parsha, which is Vayigash, we had the same passage. The Torah told us, after Yaakov found out that, that Yosef, his son, was still alive, and Yaakov prepared to go down to Egypt, and we talked about that last week. In last week's Parsha, the Torah told us the names of all the family members. So, why, if the Torah told us the same names in last week's Parsha, does it repeat them in next week's Parsha? Says the Ramban, because of the interruption of our Parsha, this week's Parsha, the Parsha Vayechi. Because, if you think about the narrative of Bereshis, of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Torah, really the narrative ended with last week's Torah portion. At the end of last week's Torah portion, the family had been reunited and they had decided to come to Egypt and they relocated in Egypt. They were in Mitzrayim. So once they're in Mitzrayim, then the next part of the narrative is the situation declines, there's persecution, there's slavery, and then there's exodus. That's next week's Parsha. Our Parsha, Vayechi, is an interruption in the narrative. So therefore, says the Ramban, since there's an interruption, you know, <laughs> if you're involved in a conversation and you get interrupted for a few minutes, when you resume the conversation, first you just say, uh, where was I? 
What, what was the last thing that we said? Okay, now let's go forward. And basically, that's what happens. That's what the Ramban says. So why do we have an interruption? Because our Parsha, Vayechi, largely relates to the death of Yaakov. Now, that is certainly an important and sad event, but why must this entire Parsha concerning the death of Yaakov be placed here, forming as it does an interruption in the narrative requiring a repetition next week where the narrative resumes? So the Rav approaches this from the point of view of halacha, from the point of view of Jewish law. What halacha, what aspect of Jewish law is introduced in this week's parsha? The subject of avelus, of mourning, of burial, and sitting shiva. The Torah tells us in our parsha, after Yaakov died, after he was buried, they mourned for seven days. Now, there's a question among authorities whether our practice of sitting shiva, of observing seven days of mourning, is a biblical obligation or it's a rabbinic obligation, but clearly it takes as its model what we have in our parsha. And the Rambam, Maimonides, phrases this in a very interesting way. Listen, please, to how Maimonides, the Rambam, presents this requirement. The Rambam, first of all, is of the opinion that observing seven days of mourning, sitting Shiva, is a rabbinic enactment, but it is a rabbinic enactment from the earliest rabbinic legislator, Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, of course, communicated the Torah from God to the Jewish people, but Moshe was also a dayan, a judge, a legislator. And there is legislation, rabbinic legislation, that Moshe legislated on a rabbinic level in addition to communicating God's Torah on the divine level, on the biblical level. And the Rambam says as follows, Moshe Tikain, Moshe legislated seven days of mourning and seven days of celebration after marriage. Very interesting. Yes, it is true that they're both seven days, but it's very curious that the Rambam mentions that it was a single piece of legislation. In other words, Moshe legislated seven days for mourning and for marriage. Since they are so diametrically opposite each other when it comes to emotion, why would these two pieces of legislation actually, according to the Rambam, be mentioned together as a single legislative act. Rav Salvechik explained as follows. The expression of grief at death and joy at marriage are both expressions of the same phenomenon loneliness and the desire to overcome loneliness by being together with someone else. That's the joy at a wedding and the grief at Shiva. They're both based on the same existential need that all human beings have. The truth is, many people do not correctly understand what a Shiva visit should be, 
It's not to bring food. It's certainly not to eat food. It's not to distract the mourner or tell jokes or talk about what happened to you, the visitor. The mitzvah of making a shiva visit is simply to be there, to be present, to show by our presence, even if it is with our silence, that the mourner is not alone. Sometimes people ask me, well, what should I say if I go to a Shiva house? So there is a very wise rule given by our sages that when a person goes to a Shiva house, they should sit down and be quiet and let the mourner speak first and then respond following the lead of what the mourner wants to discuss. But if you are going to say something, let me share with you what I think is the most important thing to say when you go to a Shiva house to visit a mourner. Tell me what your loved one was like. Tell me about your father. Tell me about your, your mother, whoever it is they're sitting shit for. What were they like? What did you learn from them? The Rav actually goes one step further. The Rav said in another place, he said, the mitzvah to visit someone when they're sitting Shiva is very difficult to do properly. And he said this about himself. Now, I don't accept that he means this literally. But here's what he said about himself. He said about himself, only one time did I properly fulfill the obligation to visit someone who was sitting Shiva. And what I did was, someone was sitting Shiva. I went to their home. I sat down beside them. They were crying. I was crying. And we sat in silence for about an hour. And then I left. That's what it means. By our presence, even if it is by our silence, to communicate you are not crying alone. You are not sitting alone. And the same idea is in both pieces of legislation, or as the Rambam would put it, it is one law, one halacha, that expresses itself in opposite emotional circumstances. And that is to express ourselves emotionally when someone else is going through either loneliness or overcoming loneliness, either through grief or celebration. And that that expression should be regulated and structured so the Jewish law fleshes out for us how those seven days of celebration are to be marked and how those seven days of Shiva, of grief, should be marked. Our Parsha, the Parsha Vayechi, is an interruption in the narrative. But it's an important interruption because it teaches us about our most basic human nature and how 
we may seek to overcome it. Then the Rav suggested a second, completely different approach to understanding our Parsha, the Parsha Vayichi. Because I mentioned this to you in the name of the Ramban, but all of the classic commentators ask that the Parsha of Vayichi, our Parsha, seems extraneous to the book of Bereshis. If you think about a book, and I mentioned this this morning, it's always important to keep in mind that the Torah is organized into five books, not by accident, but on purpose, because each of the books, like any book, has an internal theme, a beginning and an end. And the end of the narrative, as I mentioned before, is the Jewish people in Egypt. That was, as I mentioned, the end of last week's Parsha, the Parsha Vayigash. So, what's the theme of the Book of Bereshis? If the theme is creation, creation of the world, creation of the Jewish people, well, that was accomplished when they were all reunited in Egypt in last week's Parsha Vayigash. How is the death of Yaakov necessary to the theme of Bereshis. So, let's start with the classic question. This question is asked by Rashi, classic commentator, the first Rashi at the beginning of Bereshis, the beginning of the Torah. Rashi asks the following classic comment, co question. Why does the Torah start with Bereshis? Why doesn't the Torah begin in the Parsha of Bo, which is partway through the second book of the Torah, Shemos, where the Torah says the first mitzvah that applies to the entire Jewish people, HaChodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Chodashim, that the month of Nisan the month in which the Exodus occurred, is the first month of the year, the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, of observing the lunar calendar. So let me just take a step back and explain that question. The word Torah is related to the word hora, teaching. The primary purpose of the Torah is to tell us the mitzvahs, the commandments that God wants us to do, to teach us how to act. Now, it is certainly true that in the book of Bereshis, we find actions that are mitzvahs. Peru to have children, bris mila, circumcision, Gid Hanoshe, not to eat from the sciatic nerve of an animal. We discussed all these subjects weeks ago, but I want to just be clear. Although those narratives are in the book of Bereshis and a few others as well, our obligation to observe them does not come from Bereshis. It comes from Sinai. When the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai and God commanded as a mitzvah, what had earlier been recounted as a narrative. The first mitzvah that God commands to the entire Jewish people through Moshe, in other words, the first hora teaching is when, just before the Exodus, God tells Moshe, tell the Jewish people, HaChodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Chodashim, Observing the lunar month, Rosh Chodesh, Nisan is the first month. That's the first mitzvah that's commanded to the entire Jewish people. So Rashi asks, if the purpose of Torah is the mitzvahs, the commandments, and the first commandment is a third of the way through the second book of the Torah, why does the Torah start with Bereshis Baro Lakim, Esa Shomayim Esaretz? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It's very interesting, but it's not teaching. It's not teaching. 
Okay. So all the classic commentators address this question. Just to give you a couple of examples, the Kliyakar, one of the great commentators, I've, I've, I've quoted him before, says, well, the story of creation, Bereshish Barolakim, is the basis of our belief in God, creator of heaven and earth. And belief in God is a mitzvah that we're going to learn about later. It's actually in the Aserah Sedibros, the Ten Commandments. But the basis of that belief is the narrative, Bereshish Barolakim, God created heaven and earth. So the Torah starts with Bereshish because it will give the basis for, the background to, what will later be commanded in the Torah, belief in God. Okay, that's the Kliyakar. The Ramban and others give a completely different answer, and they say as follows. Yes, the purpose of the Torah is to teach, but the Torah does not only teach us through commandments. The Torah also teaches us through narrative. From the narratives of Bereshis, we learn tremendously important lessons in how to act and in how not to act, in personality traits, in values. And we have discussed many of these over the last few weeks and in previous years. So the Ramban says, we learn lessons about how to act and how to be starting from Bereshis. But Rashi himself gives a different answer. And it's an answer that is so prescient for our day. Rashi says, and remember, Rashi's writing almost a thousand years ago. Rashi writes, There will come a time when the nations of the world will claim that the Jewish people have no right to the land of Israel. That we stole the land of Israel and we do not belong there. And therefore the Torah starts, Bereshis bara lakim as a shamayim as aretz. God created heaven and earth. And therefore, God has the right to say who belongs where. And God promised the land of Israel to the Jewish people. So according to Rashi, the main purpose of Bereshis is to establish our connection and the authority for our connection to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel. Prescient almost a thousand years ago how relevant that particular answer is to us today. Based on that answer of Rashi, the Rav now continues. In last week's Torah portion by Yigash, Yaakov leaves the land of Israel. We discussed this last week. And we discussed how he did so unwillingly. He was afraid to leave Israel to go to Egypt. Even though he would be reunited with his son, Yosef, who he had not seen in so many years, even though the family would be together after not having been together for so many years, even though he would, he and his family would be protected and taken care of during the rest of the years of famine. But he was frightened. Because he was worried that he and his descendants might never return to Israel. Remember, his father Yitzchak never left Israel. Never. Did not spend a moment of his life outside of Israel. Avraham, from the time that he arrived in Israel, did leave, but he left for a short time. He was a small group, just he, his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, 
and he came back. But Yaakov thought to himself, how will it be that an entire nation will reverse its emigration? If we're in Egypt and we're not only a family, but we become an Am, a people, Am Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael, how will we ever return to Israel? Think for a moment in all of human history. Can you think of an example where a people left their home country and then after a certain amount of time, the entire people returned? If you come up with one, you let me know. I don't know of an example. But Yaakov was determined. And Yaakov had an idea. Listen, please, to Yaakov's last words, among his last words, in our Parsha. After he had given his blessings to his children, then he said to them, Vayitzavosam, he commanded his children. Vayomer Alehem, he said to them, Ani Nesaf Elami, my life is about to come to an end. Kivru Osi El Avosoi, bury me together with my ancestors. El Hamara Asher Bistei Ephron Hachiti, in the cave that had once belonged to Ephron. Remember Ephron? That was the person that Avraham purchased this cave and this field from generations before in which to bury his wife, Sarah. We haven't heard about Ephron, Ephron in a long time, but now we have Ephron. Bury me in the field, in the cave that's in the field where my ancestors are buried that had once belonged to Ephron. In the cave, which is in the field. The place that Avraham purchased from Ephron as a burial place. Ephron's name is mentioned twice. When Yaakov finished this instruction, Yaakov passed away and his soul returned to his ancestors. <coughs> Very interesting. I can understand Yaakov wants to instruct his children where he wants to be buried. That's good advice to anybody. Let your children know what your wishes are. But why review the whole transaction? Remember, Sarah was buried there. Avraham was buried there. Yitzchak was buried there. Rivka was buried there. Leah was buried there, not Rachel. We discussed that before. And now Yaakov is going to be buried there. Okay, so that's the place where they're buried. We know. We know today. That's the place where the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried, except for Rachel. Why tell us the transaction? Why do we have to remember the narrative about Avraham purchasing the field from Ephraim? Why not just say, Bury me where my father is and my grandfather is. Rav Salvechik explained that though Yaakov had left Israel and at that moment 
Israel, the land of Israel, was alone, uninhabited by our people. Yaakov wanted to proclaim at the end of his life that his ownership continued. He wanted to remind them of the provenance of that burial place. It's not just where my father and grandfather are buried. It's the place that was purchased, that belongs to us, that is ours and will always be ours. Yaakov's burial in Israel validated and confirmed the covenant with God that the Jewish people would receive the land of Israel and the covenant of the Jewish people with the land of Israel. And that sets the pattern for all time, including today, including for us. Had Yaakov been buried in Egypt, we might never have left Egypt. Yaakov's last wish, last instruction, cements his and our connection to the land of Israel. Years ago, Rav Soloveitchik was once asked, now this was decades ago, it was before so many religious Jews from all over the world had, have made Aliyah, as we see today, moving to Israel. Before that, Rav Soloveitchik was asked, what do Orthodox Jews give to Israel? And listen, please, to his answer. He said, go to the airport in Israel. What do you see there? Coffins and students, yeshiva students. Our past and our future. What else is there to give? The death of Yaakov and our Parsha is not an interruption in the narrative. It's not extraneous to the story of Beratius. It is the culmination of Beratius, the way Rashi explains it. If the purpose of the book of Beratius is to explain and authorize the connection between God and the Jewish people and the land of Israel, that is achieved for all time by Yaakov in our Parsha. It is the completion of Beratius, the attachment of the people of Israel to the land of Israel for all time, even in absence, it is ours and we belong there because of Yaakov. Allow me to share with you a third piece also comes from Rav Soloveitchik, but I did not have the privilege to Hear this in person, but from a different source. There is a fascinating passage in the Talmud that gives a subtext to our Torah portion of Vayechi. And it's a subtext that has a tremendous practical application 
for every single one of us on a daily basis. The Talmud says that Yaakov wanted to reveal to his children the end of days, when the Mashiach would come, when the Messianic era would begin. But God withheld that prophetic knowledge from him. And when that happened, Yaakov was worried. Maybe there is something deficient in my children, in one of my children or more of my children, that God does not want me to reveal this at this time. Yaakov bikesh legalos esaketz. Yaakov wanted to share this mystical secret, but he was worried that God was telling him that his children were not worthy. His children saw that Yaakov was bothered and they wanted to reassure him. So they said to him, Yaakov, but remember Yaakov has a second name, Yisrael, which also refers to Yaakov. They said, Shema Yisrael, listen, Yaakov, listen, Israel. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, we serve the same God. We serve your God. There is no defect in us. There is no lack in our commitment to God's vision, to God's purpose, to God's commandments. You have no reason to worry about us. And if there is a reason that God withheld something from you, it's got nothing to do with us. And Yaakov was so moved and so reassured that his children were able to identify with his legacy that Yaakov said in response, in gratitude, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Liolam Voed. Blessed be the name of God for all eternity. Now, we know that the passage Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad is written in the Torah later, in the book of Devarim, in the Parsha Veschana. What this passage in the Talmud is telling us is that credo of Judaism the most fundamental statement of our belief in God did not originate then. It originated hundreds of years earlier. It was known to the patriarchs and the matriarchs. So the Talmud says, we have a mitzvah to say the Shema. The line Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad is written in the Torah. We say it aloud. The other line, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchusod Leolam Ed, is not written in the Torah. Maybe we should not say it. But Yaakov said it. So how can we omit it? So our rabbis tell us we say that line, but we say it quietly. That's why we say Shema Yisrael out loud. And the next line, Baruch Shem, softly to ourselves. This credo Shema Yisrael explains the Rav is perhaps the first truth that our patriarchs discovered, the oneness of God. The Rambam explains that even though the words are written in the Torah later, but they were addressed first by the sons to their father, Yaakov. 
he, they were speaking to Yaakov, Shema, listen, listen, Dad, listen, Abba, listen, Father, Yaakov, Yisrael. Don't worry. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. They were speaking to Yaakov. And that dialogue continues in every generation. The reading of Shema, writes the Rav, is a dialogue between the ages. The continual restaging of the historic meeting of Yaakov and his sons, pregnant with paradoxical destiny, full of import. Now that dialogue in every generation is that parents confront their children. Parents must have expectations. And even if they cannot expect that their children will have the same outward appearance as they do. Remember, Yaakov was born in Israel. His grandchildren and great-grandchildren were born and lived in Egypt. Think about in our generation where at a certain point the outward appearance of parents and children was so different in dress in language, but in the fundamentals, in the essence of belief, in loyalty to God, parents have the right and the necessity to expect that, to ask that of their children. And children need to respond. Children need to take that seriously and to reassure their parents. Yes, even if it appears that my outward appearance is different, but my essence is exactly the same as yours. Maybe it's with a different language. Maybe it's through a different technology, but the essence is the same. And notice, when we say the Shema, we say both of those lines. In other words, every time we say Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad, and then we say quietly Baruch Shein Kavod Malchusoli Olam Voed, we are both parents and children. We play both roles. We are reassuring, and we are being reassured. And this theme suffuses the entire Parsha. Aviva Zornberg states that one of the most startling questions in the entire Torah occurs in our Parsha. Near the beginning of our Parsha, Yosef, I'm sorry, Yaakov addresses Yosef and his two sons. And remember, this is before Yaakov speaks to all of his sons. At the beginning of the parsha, he speaks to Yosef and his two sons, Ephraim and Menashe. The Atta and Yaakov says the following: The Atta Shneva Necho Hanoldin Lucha Beretz Mitzrayim. And now, I want you to know, Yosef, that your two sons, these two boys here, Ephraim and Menashe, who were born to you in Egypt, Ad Boyelecha they were born to you before I came to Egypt. Lehaim. They are like my sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, Kiruvain, Vishimon, Yieli. 
I am adopting them as my children, just like Ruvain and Shimon. They're not my grandchildren anymore. They are like my children. Three psukim later, within the same conversation, the Torah records the following words. Vayar Yisrael es b'nei Yisrael es, I'm sorry. Vayar Yisrael es b'nei Yosef. Yisrael, Yaakov, sees the sons of Yosef, Ephraim and Manasseh, Vayomer, and he says, Mi Ela, who are these children? What do you mean? Who are these children? These are the just these are the two children that you've just been talking about. These are the two children that you just adopted as your own sons. What is what what does the Torah mean? What does Yaakov mean in the middle of a conversation about these two children? Mi Ela, who are these children? There are a number of answers to this question. But I want to share with you very briefly the answer given by Rabbi Shlomo Riskin. Rabbi Riskin says that this question is nothing less than the central question of all of the Book of Bereshis. At the end of his life, Yaakov is about to pass away. Not in Israel, like his father, and his grandfather, but in exile in Egypt, as we discussed. He realizes that this is the beginning of a terrible, long exile. It is our exile today, you and me. And Yaakov is worried. Yaakov is worried about us about you and me. How will we make it? After all that's been created in the book of Bereshus, a distinct family, seeing God amidst idolatry, serving others selflessly, pursuing holiness amidst profanity, the great accomplishment that is the climax of all of Sefer Bereshis, Yaakov's family. How will it survive? How will it endure in a foreign land, in a foreign culture? And he asks Yosef before he dies, these two boys that were born in Egypt, that were raised in Egypt, that are destined to live their lives and die in Egypt? Mi Ela, to whom do they belong? Which lifestyle? Which culture? Whose values? Whose goals will they have? This is what preoccupied Yaakov as he approached his own death. And that question is likewise directed to every one of us. Vayome Yosef Elaviv, and Yosef answers his father and he says, Banai Hain, they are my children. Asher Nosan Lia Lakim Bazea, that God has granted to me. They are from God, and I pledge. They will remain with God. Vayomer, and then Yaakov says, Kochem no elai vavorachem. Bring them close to me, and I will bless them. That's Yaakov's question. That is Yosef's pledge. That is the central theme of Bereshis. That is the question that is directed to every Jew, to every one of us. And we need to be able to answer like Yosef. We may look differently. 
We may dress differently than our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers. We may speak differently. We're raised in different lands, in different cultures, but all of that is external. Our essence remains to serve God, to serve others, to pursue holiness, and to put our patriarch Yaakov at ease. I know I'm going longer than I have been going lately, but I ask for your indulgence. I want to share with you something that I think that you will agree when you hear it. <clears throat> is worth hearing. <clears throat> Finally, our Parsha Vayahi instructs us in how to face death. We all fear it, some of us more than others, especially because no one knows what it's like. What does it feel like? I certainly don't know. But allow me first to share two vignettes. A few days ago, a terrible tragedy occurred in New York. You may have read about this. A drunk driver hit a car. Several people, some with connections to Montreal, were seriously injured. One young woman, Liel Namdar, tragically was killed. Her parents and her three brothers suffered a trauma we cannot begin to imagine. On Monday, she was buried in Israel. And at her funeral, her father told this story. Shortly after hearing the news, Liel's mother and brothers distraught, traumatized, sobbing. They laid down in Liel's bed at home. They wanted to be able to smell her from when she was sleeping there the night before. They were sobbing. And eventually, they fell asleep in Liel's bed. The next morning, when they woke, one of her brothers told his grieving family that he had had a dream. And in his dream, he saw his sister, Liel. She was dressed all in white. There was so much light surrounding her, he couldn't even see her face. But she spoke to him in this dream. Again, this is her father telling this story at her funeral. And she said, to her brother in this dream. Tell everyone to stop crying. I am doing amazing. I am happy. No more crying. I don't know what that means. I'm just telling you what this man said at his daughter's funeral. 
Here's a passage from the Talmud. The Gemara tells the story of two of our greatest sages, Rava and Rav Nachman, Rabbi Nachman, from the Talmud, not Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav. This is Rav Nachman in the Talmud. Rava was visiting Rav Nachman just as Rav Nachman was about to pass away. And Rava said to him, Rebbe, I want you to appear to me in a dream to tell me what happens after you die. And the Talmud says that sometime later, Rav Nachman appeared to Rava in a dream. And Rava said to him, Rebbe, did you suffer pain? And Rav Nachman said, it was like taking a hair from a cup of milk. So easy was the transition. And the Holy One, blessed be He, said to me, it's as if I were to say, you could go back to life. You could go back to that world. But you won't want to because the fear of death is so great. What we see in our Parsha is a man, Yaakov, preparing for the end of his life by instructing his children, by understanding the nature of the life he lived, by cementing his eternal connection to Israel, by ensuring his legacy through his children and his descendants through the ages, including us. We learn all this from Yaakov in our Parsha. How to live the last years and days and moments of our life. So allow me to, to conclude by distilling this with a poem that carries the ultimate message each of us should take from this Parsha. And this is a poem by Mario de Andrade, who was a poet in Brazil in the early 20th century. I counted my years and discovered that I have less time to live from here on out than what I have lived until now. I feel like that kid who won a pack of sweets. The first ones he ate with pleasure, but when he realized there were few left, he began to taste them intensely. I no longer have time for endless meetings where statute, rules, procedures, and internal regulations are discussed, knowing that nothing will be achieved. I no longer have time to support ignorant people who, despite their chronic age, haven't grown up. My time is too short. I want the essence. My soul is in a hurry. I don't have many sweets in the package anymore. I want to live next to human, very humane people who know how to laugh at their mistakes and who are not inflated by their triumphs and who take on their own responsibilities. This is how you defend human dignity and move towards truth and honesty. It's the essential that makes life worth living. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch hearts. People who have been taught to grow up with gentle touches 
of their soul. Yes, I'm in a hurry. I'm rushing to live with the intensity that only maturity can give. I don't mean to waste any of the leftover sweets. I'm sure these will be delicious, a lot more than the ones I've eaten so far. My goal is to reach a satisfied and peaceful end with my loved ones and with my conscience. We have two lives, and the second one starts when you realize you only have one. My friends, I want to wish you a beautiful evening and a fantastic Shabbos. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon in person.